All right, welcome to uh, lecture 7.1, covering everything you ever and perhaps never wanted to know about angles. We're going to go ahead and get going. I have uh, Matthew in the room with me tonight, and I believe another uh, student will be joining. Yep, and here he is again. Hopefully his speakers are working. Uh, gentlemen, feel free to ask any questions. Uh, during lecture because if you've got the question, I'm sure five other people watching this video have the same question. So don't hesitate to ask me to stop and uh, let me know if you need anything clarified. We'll go ahead and get moving into the notes for 7.1. Uh, let me type Jeremy a note real quick. Jeremy. I am already lecturing. Okay, so okay, and uh, just so you know, these notes go along with the notes that were posted in D2L for you. So if you're watching this video, I encourage you to have those notes in front of you and be filling them out with me as we move through this. Okay, so we're going to start with the very most basic material. Uh, so just the definition of, of um, a ray right here. So a ray is a directed line segment. It's directed because it has an endpoint where it begins and it moves off in one direction uh, linearly. Um, so it consists of one point on a line and all points extending in one direction from that point. So that's all lines are, are a bunch of points. And we know that already because we know what functions are. Um, so the first point is called the end point. You know, no, no, no brilliant creativity there. We're going to name it for exactly what it is, an end point. <laughs> Um, and then we have our first look at what an angle is. Notice an angle is named with three points on it. This one uh, called DEF. Um, the middle one is always going to be your vertex, and then you can name it um, moving in any direction that you would like, whether you wanted to name it FED or DEF, but you definitely want that E in the center letting everybody know that that's your vertex. But what an angle is, is the union of two rays having a common endpoint. When you have that common endpoint, that is then called a vertex. So the vertex of our angle is uh, point E. Okay, so we usually name a uh, we usually name angles with Greek letters. Now, these are not all the Greek letters you're going to see come up tonight. Um, and, uh, well, when we get to linear and angular speed, we'll have a couple more thrown in. But these are the general Greek letters that are used to name angles. So we have theta, which is basically a, a, a tall zero with a line going through it. Uh, if some people are doing it fast, they just kind of loop around like that if they're if they're writing it quickly. Uh, and then we have, uh, th this can be pronounced two ways. I've heard it pronounced two different ways, phi or phi. Um, and then we have alpha. And by the way, uh, most people draw that, that phi symbol with just uh, making kind of like a, a Q type swirly. Um, or they can draw it more like, the um, the uh, uh, oh my goodness I just lost the name of the set <laughs> the empty set um, goodness or no solutions that, that we we also use that some for no solutions alpha um, most people draw the alpha by doing this little fish looking thing um, and then we have beta which is basically a capital B with a long tail and then we have gamma which uh, is kind of like a Y symbol there. 
Okay, uh, the next thing uh, that we have to look at, basically the first part of this lecture is very definition heavy since we're just introducing this idea and very little actual problems to solve. So if this tends to be a little more on the boring side of a lecture and not so much doing, uh, sorry, but we have to wade through all of these definitions. Um, so we have a uh, an angle in standard position here, and um, we can talk about the different sides of an angle. So let's go ahead and fill in some of these blanks below here. The measure of an angle is the amount of rotation from the initial side. Um, so my initial side is shown right here, or if we want to go back up to this drawing right here, um, rotation from the initial side to the terminal side. So you have that initial ray and that terminal ray that completes your angle. Um, probably the most familiar unit of measuring angles is the degree. Um, it's, it's pretty common knowledge that there are 360 degrees in a circle, so tick mark, even, evenly spaced tick marks basically around uh, the circle. In sacred geometry, the 360 holds, a, holds um, great importance in the fact that that completes a circle, um, but that's not the class you're taking with me, so I won't go too deep into that. One degree is one three hundred sixtieth of uh, the entire circular rotation. So a complete circular rotation is 360 degrees. Um, you should always put the unit uh, degree after, so it's 360 degrees is the little floating O symbol up in the air, or you can write out degrees, I think in the notes later on, I use DEG to mean degrees just because I was being lazy and didn't type out the whole word. Um, and we consider these angles to be in standard position if the vertex is located at the origin when placed on a set of uh, axes, uh, the Cartesian plane there. Um, so if its initial side, uh, well, the vertex is located at the origin and the initial side extends along the positive x-axis, so it's going out in the positive x there with its initial side. This this angle here is considered to be in standard position. If the angle is measured, and I'm going to use colors to show you this because some people get confused with clockwise and counterclockwise. If the angle is measured counterclockwise, that, that is considered a positive angle. Positive. And if the angle is measured counterclockwise, well, it suffices to say, I'm sure you can guess, it's called a negative angle. Okay, let's push forward. Once again, feel free to stop me if you need to ask any questions. Um, because when we we superimpose these angles, or or rather when we superimpose these angles onto an x y plane, um, if it's if that angle's terminal side lies on any of the axes. So we've got 90 degrees, 180, 270, and 360. These angles have a special name, and they're called quadrantal angles um, because they cover full quadrants 
in the XY plane. Um, that's just that, 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 that's not critical information, but good to know the language of, of these being special quadrantal angles. Um, okay, so let's, let's start diving in a little deeper just past this surface knowledge of angles because we want to begin to explore how we can talk about um, how large these angles are, the area that they cover, um, the, and we'll, we'll get into talking about sectors, like the, 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 the length of the arcs um, that, that this rotation creates. So um, let's go ahead and move forward into that. Um, an arc may be a portion of a full circle. It can be a full circle itself. Or it can be more than a full circle, which is represented by more than one rotation through that, that circular plane. Um, the uh, length of the arc um, around an entire circle, and, and, and you may not have ever have ever thought about this particular thing in in these terms, but the length of the arc that moves around the entire circle, that is the circumference of the circle. So it would be, uh, we're, we're talking about the length of the arc that's created from the quadrantal 360 degree angle there. Well, we know from our previous studies in mathematics that the formula for a circle is 2 pi r, um, which I'll back up just a second and remind you that although we think of pi, as this value 3.14, first of all, that value is rounded. Um, pi is irrational, and so that, that number's been cut off at its hundredth place. So it's an estimation of pi. The actual, the actual um, relationship that produces pi is the um, the uh, circumference of the circle? So the circumference of the circle divided by its radius. And no, I'm sorry, divided by its diameter. So this is pretty crazy because it does not matter what size circle you're dealing with. Um, whenever you measure around the outside of that circle and divide it by the diameter of the circle, you're always going to come out with the number or the value pi. That's what pi is. So um, when we are when we are uh, trying to solve for the circumference of the circle, pi is involved in that calculation. So 2 pi r. Now, if I solve for 2 pi in this, in this particular formula here by dividing r off of both sides, we can see that the ratio of the circumference divided by the radius, not the diameter, but the radius, is given as 2 times pi. So whenever I divide the circumference by the radius, I get 2 pi. Well, 2 pi is approximately 6.28. So what this tells you is that if you took a string as long as the radius, and used it to measure consecutive lengths around the circumference, you would end up with one of those lengths, 
two of those links, three, four, five, six, and some change right there. And that change is the point to eight. So what we discover about this is that the circumference of the circle um, ends up ends up taking us through two pi radians of um, of the circle. So a full circle is two pi radians, and we're about to talk about what the heck is a radian. So um, we'll move forward. What is a radian? <laughs> One radian is the measure of a central angle. So a central angle is just the angle that is formed when the vertex is on the origin and your initial side is on the positive x-axis and you have some terminal side. So that is, this is considered a central angle of the circle that intersects an arc equal to the length of the radius. So one radian is produced when the length of my subtended arc is equal to the length of my radius. When I have this relationship, that is equal to one radian. Okay? So, um, a central angle is an angle formed at this. Okay, so I've already said that. Because the total circumference equals uh, 2 pi times the radius, a full circular rotation is 2 pi radius. Okay, so we have some common rotations. They're degree equivalent and they're radian equivalent right here. So one full rotation, that's a 360 degree rotation, that is also a 2 pi radian rotation. So, so radians and degrees are just two different methods of measuring the same type of thing. If I make half a rotation through the circle, that's a straight angle, which is 180 degrees, or I have made pi radian rotations through my circle. Um, and then I have a quarter of a rotation, which pr produces that 90 degree angle, or I can say that is pi over two radians um, of rotation. Okay, so relating arc length to the radius, which we, we've already talked about one relationship, and that is when, the, when they're the same, when, you're, when your radius is the same as your arc length of that subtended angle, then that's equal to one radian. So an arc length, given by the variable s, is the length of the curve along the arc of the circle. And we are given the formula, arc length, is equal to the radius times, there's our theta there, and don't forget, theta is the measurement of that subtended angle. Now, if I want to solve for theta, I can come in here and divide both sides by r and get that theta is equal to s divided by r. Now, if we go back to saying, okay, well, let me, let me draw a circle here. Y'all don't laugh at my circle. Whoa, that was really bad. Let me just close it off right there. <laughs> we'll pretend like the hair on the circle doesn't even exist. Okay, so if I have...
my initial side and um, I think I'm on terminal side here. If my arc length S is equal to my radius. Oops, I grabbed a white pen and you can't see that. There we go. Equal to my arc, uh, my radius R. That's going to put my arc length being equal to my radius, which we already know gives us one radian. That ratio of R over R is equal to one one radian. And don't forget, there are 6.28 radians around the whole circle. Or 2 pi radians. Okay. Um, so just a little bit more here about radians. Um, we have the one, the two, the three. It takes you all the way around the circle there. Um, we also have that one radian ratio set up here. Here's two radians, so it's basically doubling, um, doubling your arc length. with still having radius r, so now my arc, arc length is 2r, that's 2 radians. Because when I put that into ratio, 2r divided by r, I end up with 2 radians there. Okay, so let's take a look at this example down here. We are given the information that a 45 degree angle it, it has a radian value of pi over 4. So pi over 4 radians is equal to a 45 degree angle. Um, we would like to uh, show how it does not matter the size of the circle. My radians are going to be the same. Um, as long as the arc and the radius are in the same ratio to each other. So here I have a circle inside of another circle. The inner circle has a radius of 2. The outer circle has a radius of 3. And we're going to show that no matter which circle you use, we're always going to get pi over 4 radians as the rotated measurement of that angle through the circle. So let's start out with our formula for the circumference. So we have circumference is equal to 2 pi r. With the smaller circle, so the small circle, That's an arrow. That looks really, it looks like a blob. I gotta get, I gotta fix that. That's terrible. These tablets can be so challenging to write on. Even though I've done it for a long time now, it's still challenging. There's a, there's a bad arrow, but not as bad as the blob that was there a moment ago. Okay, so if I want to, um, find an expression for the circumference of the small circle. Uh, the circumference is equal to 2 pi, and this one has a radius of 2, my small circle here. That gives me a circumference of 4 pi for the small circle. Now let's look at the larger circle. So circumference is equal to 2 pi r. This one has a radius of 3. So the circumference of my larger circle is 6 pi. Now, um, if I go back to the relationship that I have between the 
subtended angle and um, the arc length and the radius. I have theta is equal to, remember theta is my angle, theta is equal to my arc length divided by my radius. So let's take a look at these for the small circle and the large. So theta equal to that's there wrong. Let me give myself a little barrier there so it doesn't run together. Okay, so for my small circle, I have theta is equal to, well, my arc length is equal to um, my radius times my um, arc length. No, I'm sorry, my radius. So my rate, let me go ahead and just plug it in for the sake of, for the sake of uh, room here. So um, let, let, me, let me tell you how I got that. If I have theta equals S over R, if I want to solve for S, I multiply both sides by R. I didn't want it to look like magic there. So my arc length is equal to R theta. So I can plug in R, and I know my theta. I'm told that it's pi over 4 radians. And I have 2 times pi over 4, and that's divided by my radius, which is 2. So I divide my 2's out, and I get theta is equal to pi over 4. Let's look at it with the large circle. Theta equal to, this time it's 3 times pi over 4 over 3. My 3's divide out, and I get that theta is pi over 4. So this just goes to show that it does not matter the size of the circle. That angle of rotation is going to be the same um, as long as that same ratio is set up. So they have the same angle measure, even though the arc length and the radii, the radii differ, they're still in proportion to each other. Okay, so this is going to be a very, very helpful thing for you to complete and to keep near you for the rest of probably the semester, but at the very least the rest of this chapter until you put these to memory. So what we're going to do on this circle is identify the corresponding radian measurement uh, to the degree measurements of this circle here. And we'll learn in a later section that this is the setup we use with our unit circle. Um, so that's important information to come. All right, so let's start with um, the most obvious ones. We have already established that 180 degrees is pi radians. And I've also established that if I go all the way around the circle, that's 2 pi radians. Okay? So, and I'm not going to leave these, well, I guess I can leave these here. I've got plenty of room. So if I go here, that's pi radians, and if I go all the way around, that's 2 pi radians. So if I, if I think about my pi radians and my 180 degrees, 90 degrees is half of 180 degrees. So if I multiply my 90 degree angle, uh, I'm sorry, my, my um, 180 degree angle pi by half, I end up at 90 degrees, which is considered pi over 2. That's half of pi there. 
So when I move in 90 degree increments around the circle, I'm adding another half pi. So if I start at zero, zero to 90 degrees, that's half of pi, so pi over two. If I move in another 90 degrees, that's pi, because that, that, that's two pi over two, which is just pi. And if I move another 90 degrees, that's three pi over 2. And then I move all the way around 4 pi over 2, which is 2 pi. Okay? So uh, our 30 degree angle, if we take that 180 degrees, that straight angle, and divide it by 6. That's 30 degrees. So one sixth of the straight angle is 30 degrees. One sixth of pi, which is the straight angle, is pi over six. So now when I move 30 degrees, I add a sixth of pi to it. So to go from 30 to 60 degrees, I started out with understood 1 pi over 6, so 60 degrees is 2 pi over 6, which is the same thing as, and let me get a different color here, which is the same thing as pi over 3, okay? If I move another 30 degrees, that's 3 pi over 6, which is the same thing as pi over 2, because if I divide my 3's out, if I move another 30 degrees, that takes me to 4 pi over 6. That's a pi symbol, which is the same thing as If I divide a 2 out of the numerator and denominator, 2 pi over 3. Okay, if I move another 30 degrees, that's another 6. So 5 pi over 6. And another 30 degrees is 6 pi over 6, which is just pi. Another 30, 7 pi over 6. Another 30, 8 pi over 6, which is the same thing as 4 pi over 3 by dividing that 2 out. Another 30 degrees is uh, 9 pi over 6, which is the same thing as 3 pi over 2 already established that. Another 30 degrees, 10 pi over 6, which is the same thing as 5 pi over 3. Another 30 degrees is 11 pi over 6. And then our last 30 degrees, 12 pi over 6 which reduces to 2 pi. Okay, let's take a look at 45 degree angle. We already know that this is pi over 4. We learned that in our last problem. So every time I move 45 degrees through the circle, that's going to add another fourth pi to it. So, I have understood 1 pi over 4 for 45 degrees. If I move 45 more, that's 2 pi over 4, which you can see reduces to pi over 2. Another 45 degrees is 3 pi over 4. Another 45 degrees is 4 pi over 4. Jeremy, I see you're typing something. I'm going to keep on going until you get done typing, and then I'll answer your questions. 
Another 45 degrees is 5 pi over 4. Another 45 degrees. Okay, no, no worries, Sherry. Um, so we are at 5 pi over 4, so this is 6 pi over 4, which reduces to 3 pi over 2. Another 45 degrees, 7 pi over 4. Another 45 degrees, 8 pi over 4, which reduces to 2 pi. And um, then I've actually uh, almost filled in all of the thirds. So we figured out that 60 degrees was pi over 3. I have that in orange there. If I jump another 60 degrees, that's 2 pi over 3. Another 60 degrees is 3 pi over 3, which reduces to pi. Another 60 degrees is 60 to 40, so I've already got 4 pi over 3 there. Another 60 degrees, you already see 5 pi over 3. And then finally, the last 60 degrees, 6 pi over 3, which reduces to 2 pi. Okay, let me stop there and ask any questions about how we were able to um, fill in all the radian equivalents to these uh, to these degree or angles given in degrees. All right, it looks like everybody's good. Okay, so oh, I wanted to grab a picture of it and put it onto this page so we can use it. Yes, Jeremy, you have a question. I'm going to be taking a screenshot while you're typing that question. And I'm going to make it small so it doesn't cover the whole page, but we can still refer to it. Marvels of modern technology. And before I get going on these problems, I'm going to wait to see what Jeremy has to say. And take a sip of water. Everybody that's watching the video, this is giving you time to study your circle down there and become more familiar with your radian equivalents. Uh, go ahead. I don't know how to ask it in words. <laughs> okay. Well, if the words come to you, Jeremy, let me know. And maybe as we move a little further, your question will get answered. All right. So. We are asked here to find the radian measure of one-third of a full rotation. Okay, so be very, very careful with the wording of these. It's very tempting to just put pi over 3 and not be thinking about what they're asking because pi over 3 is not correct. We want one-third of an entire rotation. Well, an entire rotation is 360 degrees, and we want one-third of that. Remember, whenever you have fraction of, like one-third of, decimal of, percent of, that's multiply. So uh, 360 times one-third is 360 divided by 3, which gives us 120 degrees. Okay, so now we can go down to where we've already done the work and see that 120 degrees is equivalent to 2 pi over 3 radians. So 2 pi over 3 radians is your answer there. And this is the same.
same dang question, and I noticed that after I had sent out the notes and published them. <laughs> so we're going to make up a different problem, and we'll say um, find the radian measure of three-fourths of a full rotation. Okay, so if I start out knowing I have 360 degrees, and I want to know what is three-fourths of that, 3 times 360 is 1080, and 4 times understood 1, right there, is 4. And 1080 divided by 4 puts me at 270. And if I look down here, 270 degrees in its most simplified form is 3 pi over 2 radians. Okay, because degrees and radians both measure angles, we need to be able to convert between them. Oh, this is what we do. Oh, no, yeah, we need to be able to convert between them. Um, we can do so uh, by using a proportion of theta measured in degrees to uh, the straight angle 180 degrees, that ratio uh, being equivalent to Theta measured in radians, that's what that sub R means. That means measured in radians to um, also the straight angle pi. So we want to set this proportion up. And a proportion is just equating two ratios. Um, basically, it's saying the measure of the angle to 180 degrees is equivalent to the measure of the angle in radians to pi radians. All right, so for pi over 6, we want to convert this to degree measurement. So all I'm going to do is set up that, um, that proportion. I have some angle measure theta is to 180 degrees as pi over 6 is to pi. Well, on the right-hand side, we know we never divide fractions. We multiply by the reciprocal. So that right-hand side is the same thing as pi over 6 multiplied by the reciprocal of pi, which is 1 over pi. And I can divide my common factor of pi out of uh, the numerator and the denominator. And simplifying that, I have theta over 180 is equal to 1 sixth. Now I can cross multiply. I hate to even use that phrase because students get it stuck in their head and then they try to cross multiply when it's not appropriate. So here's how you, what you need to remember about cross multiplying. Cross Multiplying only happens across an equal sign. So cross multiplying happens across an equal sign. Never anywhere else. So six, and, and all cross multiplication is, is multiplying the, by both denominators on both sides all in one step. So six times theta is six theta. And 180 times 1 is 180. Divide both sides by 6. And I get that theta is equal to 30 degrees. So we've already, we already knew that, though. We knew that from walking around the circle and, and putting the um, radian equivalence to those degrees, but this just shows you. All right, same thing here. Theta over 180 is equal to 3 over pi. Don't have to do any fractiony business this time. I'm sure y'all are appreciative of that. I can go ahead and cross multiply. Pi theta is equal to 180 times 3 is 540. And then I come and divide both sides by pi. And 
and I get that theta, theta's deg degree equivalent when I, when I put, by the way, you really should use your pi key in your calculator, not 3.14. That creates round off error. You never round until you get to the very end of a calculation. Um, so phi, unless, unless it explicitly states to use the estimation 3.14 as pi. Other than that, use your pi key on your calculator, which is on the right-hand side, right above your operator keys. I believe it's the second function to the caret button. Um, the button that takes you up into the exponent. It's the second function on that. I think I don't have my calculator sitting in front of me. I'm uh, being a bad student tonight. Actually, I left it where I had my computer earlier when I was using it. Okay, so when I divide 540 by pi, I get approximately 171.887, and your textbook rounds that to 172 degrees, approximately. That's why I have the wavy equal sign there. Okay, and finally, theta over 180 equal to negative 3 pi over 4 divided by pi. So we have to do our fractiony business here. Theta over 180 is equal to negative 3 pi over 4 times the reciprocal 1 over pi. My pi's divide out again, and so I have negative 3 fourths times 1. So I have theta over 180 equal to negative 3 over 4. I am ready to uh, cross multiply now. And I have 180 times negative 3. Where did my theta go? Hang on just a second. I divided it out. Okay, I'm good. I just did different steps when I was working through it earlier today. 180 times negative 3 is negative 540, and theta times 4 is 4 theta. And then I'm going to come and divide that 4 off. And I get theta equal to negative 135 degrees. Okay, uh, gentlemen, give me a green check if you're good to go so far. Okay. Cool. All right, going the opposite direction, converting degrees to radian measure. Same process, same formula, theta over 180 equal to um, theta in radian measures divided by pi. So now we're just plugging in for degrees and solving for um, theta radians. So 15 is to 180 as theta in radians is to pi, cross multiply, 15 pi equal to 180 degree radians, divide, uh, divide 180 off of both sides, And when I put 15 pi divided by 180 into my calculator, actually I didn't put it into my calculator, I left it in fraction form. I took, um, let's see, it looks like 15 goes into 180, 15 goes into 15 one time, so I'm just left with pi in the numerator, and 15 goes into 180 12 times, so pi over 12 radians. 126 degrees is to 180 degrees as theta radians is to pi. Cross multiply 126 pi equal to 180 theta radians. Divide both sides by 180. And I reduced that fraction again. 
I took it down by twos. <laughs> I won't take y'all through that painstaking process because it takes three levels to get down there. But we end up, when we uh, divide out our common factors, looks like our common factor ended up being uh, 18. Uh, we end up getting 7 pi over 10 radians. Yes, Jeremy, do you have the words? Okay. For those of you that are watching the MP4 version, you don't see the chat window, but uh, Jeremy has a question on this page. So I'm just waiting for him to type that question in. Uh, does our calculator need to be in radiant when converting from degrees to radians? Uh, no, but there will be there will be a time coming up very soon when you're going to have to be very diligent about making sure your calculator is in the right mode, switching between degree and radians. But not tonight. You're good to go just having it because because we're not we're not putting radians into our calculator and we're not putting actual degree units. All we're doing is calculation with real numbers here. That's a great question though, Jeremy, and I'm sure other people had the same question. If they were smart enough to think of something like that. Okay, here we have negative 75 over 180 equals theta r. Jeremy, I still I see you're still typing. I'm going to go ahead and go for the sake of time here. Over uh over pi. So negative 75 pi equal to 180 theta radians. And I'm going to divide both sides by 180 again. And here my fraction reduces down to negative 5 pi over 12 is equal to theta in radians. Okay, let me see what Jeremy says. Also with example 1, once I hit mass enter for the fraction when dividing, oh, I don't, I don't know about, I don't know about, um, the fraction key in your calculator. I just use the division symbol. And I don't need, I wouldn't even put that into my calculator. The only thing, the, 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 the way I did, the way I did that was I said, okay, well, five, five goes into 15 three times and, um, 5 goes into 180, I don't have my calculator right here, 5 into 180, and see, it goes in there, uh, 3, that's 15, uh, 30, 5 goes into 36, so that's 3 over 36, and then um, 3 goes into 3 once and into 36 12 times. So one understood one pi over twelve. Did that help you, Jeremy? I'm sorry I don't know about that fraction key, but I think Satan spawned that fraction key because it keeps my students from actually working in fractions and you have to know <laughs> you have to know how to work in fractions because you're going to have a time come, actually you've already had a time come in college algebra where your fractions are rational expressions where they've got expressions in the numerator and denominator, but they're, they're just big, nasty-looking fractions with variables in them. So you have to know how to work with fractions to be successful. So I, I'm sorry I can't help you with that. Maybe the tutorial center can, but that's how I did it, was just reducing that the real number part of that fraction down and just leaving pi there.
Okay, if two angles in a, a standard position have the same terminal side, they are considered co-terminal, which should make sense, angles. Co is with terminal, the terminal side of the angle, so they have the same terminal side. They're with each other on that terminal side. So in our example down here, the positive angle 140 and the negative angle 220 are considered to be co-terminal. They have that same terminal side, just moving opposite ways through the circle. Now, this little statement here that I took a screenshot out of your book and put here, any, it's very important. Any angle has infinitely many coterminal angles because you can move through the circle as many times as you want to before you stop and say, that's my angle. So it's possible to have a 720 degree angle if you want to start zipping through the circle full rotation. That would be two full rotations through the circle to have 720 degree angle. So, um, so whereas if I go here, that's 140 degree angle, but I could keep on going around and land at that same terminal side, and let's see, 140 and 360, that's um, five, a 500 degree angle is also coterminal with negative 220 because it lands at the same spot. It's just one more time through the circle. A green check if that made sense. A red X if it didn't. <laughs> I hope to not see red X's, but okay, good, green check. But if I do see red X's, I'm happy to address the issue before moving forward. Okay, an angle's reference angle is the measure of the smallest positive acute angle T formed by the terminal side of that angle T and the horizontal or x-axis. So that's your x-axis. Whatever the horizontal axis is called, it's usually called x. Okay, so if this is the terminal side of my angle here. This is my reference angle because it's, it's from the terminal side down to the x-axis. And it's an acute angle, so it's positive and it's acute. All right, let's say that this is my terminal side here. This is my reference angle because it's from the x-axis to the terminal side and it's acute. And you, no matter which direction you had to move to create that reference angle, it's always considered positive. Okay, so if this is the terminal side of my angle, this is my reference angle. And if this is the terminal side of my angle, this is my reference angle. Okay? So how to? Okay, if I'm given an angle that's greater than 360 degrees, uh, to find the coterminal angle, um, you want to subtract 360 degrees from the given angle. If it's Still, if that resulting angle is still greater than 360, you're going to subtract it again until you get down to an angle between 0 and 360, and that will be your coterminal angle. 
So if I start out with an 870 degree angle and I'm trying to figure out what is the coterminal angle alpha, obviously that's bigger than 360 degrees, so I subtract 360. And when I do that, um, I end up with four, let's see. Whoa, my brain is mush. Is it five? See, I've been working since 6.30 this morning just about nonstop. So um, sorry for having to do the hand math off to the side. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy, saving me on that one. 5.10. All right, so that's 5.10. I'm still greater than 3.60. So I need to subtract another 360 off of it, and that lands me at 150. So my coterminal angle alpha is 150 degrees. That is coterminal with 870. All right. Um, what if I have a um, what if I have an angle measure that is um, negative. How do I deal with that? Well, I'm going to add 360 until I get to that angle that lives between 0 and 360 degrees. So if I start out with a negative 300 degree angle and I add 360 to it, I land at 60 degrees. So my angle beta that is coterminal to negative 300 degrees is positive 60 degrees. Okay, uh, finding coterminal angles if they are measured in radians. And I apologize, gentlemen, that I'm past 830. If you need to leave, go ahead. Um, but I should be able to finish up in about 15 or so minutes with everything. I do apologize for um, going past our time, though. All right, so find an angle beta that is coterminal with 19 pi over 4. So now instead of wanting our, wanting our angle to fall between 0 and 360, we're measuring in radians, so it's 0 and 2 pi. So just like you added 360 or subtracted 360, you're going to be adding or subtracting 2 pi here. Well, if I'm greater than 2 pi, which 19 pi over 4, if I do that division, gives me about 4.75 pi. Now, it's definitely greater than 2 pi, so I'm going to be subtracting. So 19 pi over 4 minus 2 pi over understood 1. I have to get a common denominator. Here's that. Here's some of that fraction business that you got to know how to do. I have to get a common denominator to be able to subtract those fractions. So I multiply by the clever form of 1, which is perfectly legal for me to go around and multiply by. 1 doesn't change anything. I'm just multiplying by a clever form of it that makes it look different. So 19 pi over 4 minus, multiply fractions straight across, 8 pi over 4 lands me at, well, now I can combine my numerators over my common denominator, and 19 pi minus 8 pi leaves me at 11 pi over 4. That is still greater than 2 pi. If I divide 11 by 4, it's uh, 2 and 3 fourths. So I need to do another round of subtraction. 11 pi over 4 minus, well, we already know what 2 pi over 4 in terms of fourths is, and that's 8 pi over 4. And that leaves me at 3 pi over 4. So angle beta that is coterminal with 19 pi over 4 is 3 pi over 4. All right, same thing with a negative angle given in radians, except I'm adding 2 pi now. So I start at negative 17 pi over 6, and I add 
2 pi over understood 1. I've got to get a common denominator. So pi in terms of 6 is 12 pi over 6. So negative 17 pi over 6 plus 12 pi over 6 lands me at negative 5 pi over 6. I'm still negative, and I'm supposed to be between 0 and 2 pi. So I need to add another 2 pi. Negative 5 pi over 6 plus 12 pi over 6 finally lands me at 7 pi over 6, so that is the angle theta, 7 pi over 6, that is coterminal with negative 17 pi over 6. Okay, so just a little bit of, a little bit more information reminding you about um, the arc length on the circle, <coughs> pardon me, arc length is given by uh, radius times theta, and that's however theta is given to you. Um, so if you're given a circle of radius r, you calculate the arc length s uh, of, the, of the arc subtended by the given angle measure theta by plugging it into that uh, formula there. And if it gives it to you in one form, degree or radians, and asks for the other, you may have to do some conversion before you can actually plug it into the formula. So we have the formula arc length equals radius times theta. All right, let's take a look at this problem. It's actually a pretty interesting one. Okay, so we want to assume the orbit of Mercury around the sun is a perfect circle. So here's the sun. And a perfect circle is a very good band, by the way, too. And we have this orbit around the sun of Mercury. I'll draw a little Mercury out there. Okay. And what we're told is that entire orbit, no, I'm sorry, we're told that, um, that Mercury lives approximately 36 million miles from the sun. So this length here, is 36 million, and um, I, I, for, the, for the purposes of this problem, we're going to consider that distance to be to the center of the sun, so that that's giving us our true radius of our circle there. Um, so we are, we are told that that is 36 million, and um, in the first part of the problem, it says, in one Earth day, Mercury completes 0 .0114 of its total revolution around the sun. How many miles is that that it travels in one day? So what we're told is that in one Earth day, the uh, or Mercury travels. This is point zero one one four of its entire circumference of the orbit. So I'm just going to put C there for circumference. 0 0.0114 of the entire circumference. Um, and it wants to know how many miles is that. Well, you have to know how many miles that whole, uh, that whole revolution is. Um, 
to be able to know how many miles you've traveled there. So the first thing I'm going to do is to calculate what the full circumference of the orbit is. So the circumference, and this is of the, of the full orbit. Well, we know circumference of a circle is 2 pi r. In this case, that's 2 pi, and then we have 36, and that's 36 million. So um, when I multiply 2 times pi times r, which is 36, I end up getting approximately 226.19 million miles. God, that's a lot of miles to travel. Um, okay, so to answer the question that they ask, they say, okay, well, how much did they travel in that one Earth day? I just take, uh, so this is going to be the length of my arc. Um, I just take the amount that I know it traveled of that circle, which is 0 .0114, and multiply that by my 226.19, and I get approximately 2.58 million. So it traveled 2.58 million miles in one day. Craziness. Astronomy fascinates me. Okay, the second part of the question says, use your answer from part A to determine the radian measure for Mercury's movement in one Earth day. So we want to find the radian measure. So Theta in radians is given by our arc length divided by our radius. So in this case, our arc length is 2.58 million. And I'm dividing that by my radius, which is 36 million. And I end up getting approximately 0 0.0716 radians. And what that says is it traveled about 7%, 0 0.07, 7% of its distance, of the distance that Mercury lies from the sun. Because remember, that's how we get that ratio anyway, is the radius to that subtended arc. And, um, and um, that that movement during that one day is about 7% of that distance. Pretty interesting stuff, huh? At least in my nerdy world, stuff like this is very interesting. For the record, I do not do mathematics on Friday night for fun. All right, so find the arc length along a circle of radius 10, <laughs> um, subtended by an angle of 215 degrees. Uh, that, that's a bad picture then for a 215 degree angle. So 215 is probably more like that. So we want to figure out the arc length along the circle of radius 10 subtended by an angle of 215 degrees. Okay, so we're going to use our formula. Arc length equals radius times theta. Arc length equals 10 times, oh, I forgot. I need to convert 215 degrees into radians first. So 215 degrees to radians is 215 over 180 equals theta radians over pi 
cross multiplying, 215 pi equals 180 theta radians, divide by 180. And when I reduce that fraction down, I get 43 pi over 36 equals theta radians. So 43 pi over 36 is my um, theta radians. And S equal to, well, when I multiply 10 by 43, I get 430 pi over 36. And I can reduce that down uh, by taking a 2 out of the numerator and denominator, 215 pi over 18. And when I put that into my calculator, I get approximately 37.525 uh, units. In the units. So, units. Finding the area of a sector. So now we're talking about how big is this piece of pie that I have there? How much area does it cover? We can also use angles to find the area of a blank, a sector of a circle. So when you have a pi piece out of a circle, that's called a sector. A sector is a region of a circle bounded by two radii and the intercepted arc, like a slice of pizza. Now I'm hungry. Okay, so the area of a sector is given by, uh, well, we have the area of a circle first. Area of a circle is pi r squared. So if you look at the formula that we're given, this part is the area of the circle. And then that other part that we're multiplying by is the ratio of angle measurement theta divided by the uh, angle measure of the full circle. So it's that ratio of the angle of the pi piece to the angle of the whole circle. Does that make sense? Do y'all see that? Green check or red X? Okay. So Jeremy, all that orange part is saying, do you get the green part, Jeremy? Let me ask you that. Do you understand where the pi r squared came from? Okay. So, yeah, the green part is representing the entire area of the circle. And what I'm multiplying the entire area of the circle by is the ratio of this angle theta to the entire circle angle to pi in radians. So it's taking the ratio of the pi piece to the whole circle and multiplying it by the area of the circle. So it sets up the ratio first, and then it multiplies it by the area of the entire circle to get the area of that pi piece. Better? Worse? <laughs> no comment? Okay. <laughs> All right, so you multiply fractions straight across, so you get uh, theta pi r squared over 2 pi. You can divide your pi's out, and you're left with uh, pulling that understood 1 half off there, 1 half theta r squared as the area of a sector. Okay, in a central, in central pivot irrigation, y'all get to see more of my lovely drawings here. Uh, central pivot irrigation, a large irrigation pipe on wheels rotates around a center point. A farmer has a central pivot system with a radius of 400 meters. And the water restrictions only allow the farmer 
to um, to water 150 square meters per day. So basically what this is saying is this whole area that it needs to water, that it's allowed to water per day, the, the pie piece, the area of the pie piece is equal to 150,000 square meters. Um, and the question is, okay, to only, to only water that much area per day, what angle should she set her irrigation system on? So we're going to take that formula for the area of a sector and solve it for theta. So we have the area of a sector, I'm just going to draw a little pie piece there, equal to one-half theta r squared. I already know my area is 150,000 square miles. And that is equal to one half, theta is what I'm trying to solve for. This is square miles, by the way, it's a mile squared. Um, times my radius, 400, I'm sorry, meters, not miles, uh, 400 meters squared. Okay, so 150,000 meters squared equal to one-half theta. 400 squared is 160,000. And that's meters squared as well. I'm going to start by getting rid of that fraction by multiplying by its reciprocal on both sides, two and two, so that one-half of two is one, so it goes away. And I'm going to come up over here to finish. 2 times 150,000 is 300,000 meters squared equals 160,000 meters squared theta. I divide both sides by 160,000 meters squared to solve for theta. My meter squares divide out, and my 160,000 in my meter squared divide out there as well. And when I put 300,000 divided by 160,000 into my calculator, I get that theta is approximately 1.88 radians. So that's what uh, she needs to set that on to make sure she only waters what she's supposed to. Okay, angular speed and linear speed. Um, an object traveling in a circular path has two different types of speed. We have linear speed, which is basically that speed along the circumference, that, that, that line, that, or that curve, rather, that makes up the circumference. So we have that speed along the straight path. And it can be determined by the distance it moves along, which is also known as its displacement, in a given time interval. So linear speed is given by this V looking, uh, I think that's called nu in Greek. Um, so this is linear speed. And that is given by dividing my um, arc length by my time. Okay, so we also have this thing called angular speed. And this is the speed that results from the circular motion. And that can be determined um, by the angle through which the point rotates in a given time. So, here we have, um, that's omega. Omega is telling us angular speed. And angular speed is given by um, the angle theta that it is traveled through divided by the time.
Now, this is where it gets a little complicated, so pay attention. If I want to somehow relate angular speed, which is based on theta, and linear speed, which is based on arc length, I can put the two equations together with a little bit of a little bit of math magic and um, be given a formula for linear speed that is based on angular speed. So we start out with our given formula for uh, the length of an arc. And we know from the formula above, right here, that um, angular speed is given by theta divided by t. Well, if I want to solve for theta, I can multiply both sides by t. And that gives me theta equal to um, t omega, or omega t. So if I take that piece of information and replace theta in that formula, I now get that my arc length is equal to my radius times my angular speed times my time. And then if I further would like to complicate things, I can now say, well, my linear speed, nu, is equal to my arc length divided by my time. I can replace arc length now here with radius times angular speed times time. That's being divided by time. Time divides out. And here is my formula relating angular and linear speed. Angular speed is equal to my radius times my angular speed. Linear speed is equal to radius times angular speed. Let's use this formula, and then I promise we'll be done. Okay? So, um, given the amount of angle rotation and time elapsed, you can calculate angular speed using the formula uh, theta divided by t. So, angular speed is equal to theta divided by time. I have this old vinyl record played on a turntable rotating clockwise at a rate of, now clockwise, don't forget clockwise, that's a negative angle. At 45 rotations per minute. Okay. So find the angular speed per second. Ugh. So I want to go ahead and convert before I start plugging into my formula. If I am moving at 45 rotations per minute, that's what RPM stands for, and um, I know that one rotation is equal to 2 pi. That means I am moving at 90 pi radians per minute. Okay? Um, if I have my angular speed formula, I can now plug in 90 pi, because that's how many radians I'm moving through per minute, but it, it wants to know per second, not per minute, so I need to say, okay, well, and this is, this is radians per minute. If I divide that by 60 seconds per minute, I will have converted to seconds. So um, the good news is, is we don't ever divide fractions. We multiply by the reciprocal. So I have 90 pi radians per minute multiplied by the reciprocal. One minute is equal to 60 
seconds. That's that reciprocal of the denominator down there. And that's over one minute. My minutes divide out, and I'm left with 90 pi radians per 60 seconds. And I can, oh, it's negative, by the way, negative, 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 because it's going clockwise. Okay, so when I reduce that fraction, I get negative 3 pi over 2 radians per second. There we go. And to reduce that fraction, I just divided 30 out of both the numerator and the denominator. Last problem. Okay, so um, here... We have a satellite that is rotating around the Earth, <coughs> pardon me, at 0.25 radians per hour at an altitude of 242 kilometers above the Earth. Then we have the radius of the Earth is given as 6,378 kilometers. Find the linear speed of the satellite in kilometers per hour. So I have the Earth here. I know that the radius of this Earth is 6,378 kilometers, so 6,378 kilometers. And then I have this satellite that is orbiting a distance of 242 kilometers above the Earth. So if I want to find the radius of that orbit, I have to add the radius of the Earth and the 242 kilometers that that, that satellite is traveling above the Earth. So my radius of my orbit is... 6,378 kilometers plus 242 kilometers. And um, let's see, what does that give us? Zero, carry my one, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, two, carry my one, five, six, and six kilometers. Okay, and we want to know linear speed. Linear speed is given by radius times angular speed. And um, I'm told that my angular speed is 0.25 radians per hour. So angular speed is 0.25 radians per hour. And I multiply that by my radius which is 6,620 kilometers. And I, when I multiply 0.25 and 6620, I get my angular speed is 1,655 kilometers per hour. That's all I got for you, gentlemen. Oh, my gosh, I went way, way, way over, but I hope that this was helpful for you as an introduction really to the heavy trigonometry section of our semester.